Inside the DC Beltway, it's nothing but gridlock. Will the Supreme Court be the third branch of government that has to shut it down at least for a time? I got two experts here on For the Record, starting right now. The Commonwealth's attorneys and I have concluded that the NCAA sanctions were overreaching and unlawful. Someone's got the bubble product, you and I as a consumer are going to want to buy. The country needs a comprehensive energy. Good morning and welcome to this edition of For the Record. This morning, great show for you. We are talking the Supreme Court of the United States. And to do that, we bring in two great guests, Michael Nelson, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Penn State, and Carla Pratt, Dean for Academ Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and Education Equity at Penn State Dickinson Law. Both of you, thanks for coming in this morning. Thank thanks you. for having us. Get right into it. How does Justice Scalia's death impact some of the current cases that have already been heard in front of the Supreme Court, Carla? Uh, well, even if Justice Scalia had authored an opinion on those cases, it will now be null and void. So uh, Justice Scalia will not have uh, a vote, a decision in those pending cases. The remaining justices' opinions will decide those cases. We'll get into some of those cases in a little bit, Michael. The political fallout from that, what, what, what do you know from some of those cases on where the decision's going to come down? So probably the biggest case that's going to be affected is the public sector unions case coming out of California. Lots of people thought that that was a case that was going to go in a heavily conservative direction, was going to be really bad for people who are in favor of public sector unions. Uh, but now with Scalia's death, it's likely to 4-4 tie, which means that the lower court decision is what stands, and that lower court decision was in favor of the unions. Cases in the near future, obviously, the court's not going to stand still until a new member's appointed four to four right now, pretty much most cases on how votes would come down. What does that mean for those cases that will be, say, coming up in the next 90 days? So it means if there is a 4-4 split, the current law will stand. So the decision below could not be overturned with the 4-4 split. So the decision of the circuit court would, would prevail. Um, and I think that there are some really significant courses, uh, uh, cases pending, particularly with respect to um, racial minorities. So there's the Dollar General case involving power of tribes uh, in Indian country and uh, the Fisher case with respect to race conscious affirmative action in higher education. So those were some cases that I think um, folks were really concerned could turn the, the tide with respect to mm -hmm. tribal sovereignty and race conscious admission in higher education. And now with Scalia's death, I think uh, those cases are much less likely to be uh, changing the, po the current policy. Do you feel that there may be a rush for certain cases to maybe try and get them heard as quick as possible while it is 4-4 right now? on the court. You try to rush it because you don't know who President Obama is going to pick. It's really difficult for them to do that because there's a process that the court has to go through before they hear cases. Okay. So before the court decides that they're going to hear a particular case, they have to read petitions for writs of certiorari, which are the formal ask to the court to hear the case. And so it's really unlikely that somebody would rush their writ to the court in the hope that the court would hear it and then schedule it for the very beginning of next term or something. Is there a carryover effect among some of the judges in the near future? I mean, you're going to be sitting there on the bench for the next 30 days with a chair draped in black. Is there a carryover effect on some of these cases maybe to say, well, how would Justice Scalia, at least among justices like Clarence Thomas, John Roberts, to maybe infer how he would hear a case or rule on it? I don't think so. Um, I think each of the justices brings their own perspective and, and while they're mourning the death of their colleague and they're mindful of his absence, I don't think anyone will feel the responsibility to uh, infuse Justice Scalia's viewpoints into their own duty of writing their own opinion and deciding for themselves. Can the Supreme Court function in its current state and how long can it go with a 4-4 split? It can definitely function, and I think you're asking the right question by asking how long, because if the political stalemate continues, uh, you know, this could devolve into uh, a circumstance where if, if the legislature, if the Senate is controlled by a party opposite of the president, even in the new term, 
right? If the president is elected and that president holds a party opposite to the Senate, then this could continue into a, into a new term. Right now, the, the political discussion is around um, let's wait until a new president comes into office, but the political obstructionism could continue even after a new president is seated. And that's what really concerns me is that, um, you know, how long would a political party hold out and force the court to operate with eight justices? Michael, I want to get your opinion first on that, and, and please continue your point, is what was your thought when immediately, it's like Justice Scalia, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful term, might not have been cold yet, and then you see both political factions jumping into this right away. It was kind of disrespectful in my opinion. It was, I mean, it was immediate. I was, I was on my, I was actually grading papers, and I saw on the internet that it popped up, and probably two minutes later, people started floating uh, nominees to, to fill the spot. I think people had been so focused on what the next president was going to do to try to shape the court that all of a sudden the game was changed a little bit with you have senators up for re-election trying to determine whether or not uh, the Senate is going to confirm whoever Obama nominates. You have Obama who almost certainly thought he was done having an opportunity to shape the court having appointed Sotomayor and Kagan now all of a sudden having an opportunity to do it and then you had people of all political stripes seeing games, opportunities for gamesmanship in terms of, of who's going to be appointed. So, yeah, it was, it was almost immediate that people started floating names. Carla, real quick, your immediate reaction when the news hit? Um, my immediate reaction was, as I stated earlier, with respect to the, the very, very important cases that are pending, um, was that there's probably less to worry about for those parties who don't want to see race conscious affirmative action overturned and as an academic administrator who values diversity in higher education I was really concerned about that case and and what what might happen with respect to that case who will be taking the seat of Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court of the United States we're gonna talk about some of the potential nominees President Barack Obama has to choose from you're watching WHVL's for the record Welcome back to For the Record Talking Nominations for the Supreme Court of the United States. Michael Nelson on your left, Carla Pratt in the center between us. Each party trying to claim the moral high ground right now. It's a constitutional duty, and it seems like every so many years they flip-flop. It's almost like going back to the bush Kerry election with all the flip-flop talk right now. Why, why, why the moral superiority of what's right for the country on both sides? It's, it's what they do in the Senate. It's the same thing that happens with the filibuster. When you're on one side of the coin, you love the filibuster. When you're on the other side of the coin, you, you don't love the filibuster. And I think here, because of the consequences of whoever is being confirmed to fill Scalia's seat has such breathtaking consequences for public policy that Republicans and Democrats both have every incentive to try to, tra try to claim the moral high ground in order to motivate their voters to turn out in November. Carla, I know you have a very strong stance on this with a, a recently published it on Lancaster Online about the actual duty and what Justice Scalia would want to happen. Yeah, Andrew, I think um, that the Constitution makes it very clear that the president has the power to nominate and the Senate is has a duty um, of advice and consent. So I think um, the president has a duty to make a nomination and the Senate has a duty under the Constitution to at least give that nominee a fair hearing to determine whether that person should, in fact, be appointed or not. Um, I, I think, you know, it is political because mm -hmm. uh, there are some very strong candidates that it would be difficult for the um, Republican controlled Senate to reject. So uh, they are, I think, attempting to have to, to avoid that, where they have to consider somebody who's very, very strong uh, and in the face of that, reject them nonetheless. Before we get into the specific candidates of the list that I have here, can you find a, no can President Obama find a nominee that gets through? And what are the political ramifications on both sides if he can get somebody that say maybe is the Anthony Kennedy confirmed 97 to zero? I think the, the days of uh, Supreme Court nominees getting through with unanimous support is almost certainly over. Uh, with parties now having, with, with the nomination process having become more and more public, with interest groups airing ads, 
with interest groups scoring senators' votes. So saying, you know, if you vote for this person, it's going to affect your standing with us, and we're going to inform your constituents. It's, it's really hard to get anyone through, uh, and especially in a political climate like this with the election, with the Senate being even more obstructionist than usual, it's going to be really tough for Obama to get somebody through. Off the top of your heads, do you have any specific person that you're looking for to maybe think this is going to be actually the first nomination that President Obama puts forward? So I was thinking uh, uh, the D.C. Circuit judge, uh, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing <laughs> the name, uh, I think it's Srinivasan. Yep, Sri Srinivasan. Uh, I think would be an excellent candidate, um, not, you know, overly progressive, so not too far to the left, uh, so politically more palatable, um, hopefully to, to some, uh, and I think has a very strong record as a judge, uh, and, and was confirmed uh, unanimously to the cert D.C. Circuit. So I think uh, a, a very strong, moderate candidate is probably President Obama's best, cho best hope mm -hmm. in getting an, a nominee through. Michael, your thoughts? I think... So he's definitely an excellent pick. I've, I've heard Jane Kelly mentioned a lot, who's a judge from Iowa, where Chuck Grassley is, the, is a senator from Iowa and is chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. So he's the guy that's going to decide whether or not they get hearings. Jane Kelly was just confirmed unanimously by the Senate and has a close relationship with Grassley. So it puts him in an awkward spot to have somebody that he publicly supported for a judgeship and then publicly deny that person the opportunity to get a hearing before the court. You guys are making my job easy, picking two names that I have on my list. A name that just popped up recently in USA Today, Governor Brian Sandoval, a Republican from Nevada. Nevada, they're in the news enough with the mess of what was their caucus a couple weeks ago. Thoughts on him? He is a Republican. He does have, he's pro-choice, pro-same-sex marriage, against Obamacare, but he's also gun rights. So he, he is that moderate, but maybe he leans a little bit more towards the right. I think he's an interesting pick uh, because he was a judge before he left the bench and served as governor. So he has judicial experience. And in terms of trying to thread the needle to make things difficult for Republicans, it's an interesting pick to make them publicly refuse to hold hearings for one of their own. Camilla Harris, California AG. There's been a lot of talk of her being put forth as a nominee, but she's now running for Senate for a vacant spot. I believe it is, is it Barbara Baxter that's retiring out in California. So she's running for her spot. She made it official a couple days ago. Thoughts on maybe the implications that maybe she wants to go full bore at that and she, because she might not get confirmed. Are you asking would she have to step out of the, the elect? I, I'm just, do, you, do you feel that maybe there is, in her mind, thinking, I might not get confirmed, so I'm just going to go after the Senate election instead of thinking I'm going to pull myself out, suspend my campaign, and they're not even going to hear my nomination anyway? I think if I was her advisor, I would tell her just that. Don't pull out of the race in, in the hopes of being confirmed as a Supreme Court nominee. I don't, I don't think there's enough assurance in, in this political climate uh, to justify her doing that. Like Paul Watford, he's been another name that was thrown out. He had a filibuster proof uh, vote when he was last appointed to his current judgeship. Yeah, so he's coming out of the Ninth Circuit and he's an African American male. So, you know, Obama being the first African American president, but having appointed two women to the bench, this would be an opportunity for him to appoint an African American, uh, which would, you know, make his legacy even stronger. Obama's wish list. I'm going to read them right here. An independent mind, knowing how the world really works, interprets the law, not makes the law. How important when it actually does get into the Judiciary Committee and they're asking questions that that last statement interprets the law, not makes the law to the senators? Oh, I think that will be very important. Um, the, the Republican-controlled Senate is not going to consider anyone who they perceive as a judicial activist. So um, it needs to be someone who has uh, exercised judicial restraint and can demonstrate that through their judicial record. We've talked about the cases that are implicated by Justice Scalia passing. We've talked about nom nominees that will be put forward by President Barack Obama. Now let's get into the politics a little bit. Stay with us. You're watching WHBL's For the Record.
Welcome back to For the Record. Justice Scalia has passed. It's time to find a nominee. We just heard some of the candidates President Barack Obama may put forth for a Senate Judicial Committee hearing. But there's always politics. It is Washington. Seems like nothing has gotten done the last six years except complaining and vetoes and gridlock. Does this make the Supreme Court, it seems like they actually always had the steady hand. They actually came down on decisions, whether it be five to four, and you'd hear maybe a dissent from Justice Scalia that was always riveting in the language that he wrote it in. Does this make the Supreme Court function as Congress and the executive branch? No, the, the court is always going to function as a, as a different sort of political institution because the way it does its work is so different than the way that, that Congress does. What this does do, though, is put the court back in the spotlight of the election, both in terms of the senators who are up for re-election and also the presidential election, and makes people think about what the long-term consequences are of the decisions the court makes. Michael, I'm going to throw it right back to you. Chuck Schumer, Joe Biden, President Barack Obama, whether it's 2007, whether it's 2006, whether it's 1992 with Joe Biden, they seem to all oppose late nominations or nominations made by Republican presidents. Now, is this a Johnny-come-lately thing? And how much can Republicans say, whoa, 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 don't be flipping the buck on us right now? Oh, you know, it's one of those things where if, if you're looking for similar statements by Democrats or Republicans, you can find them easily. Uh, there's been a soft norm in the Senate that uh, the opposition party in the last year or so of a president's term will uh, say that they, they can't appoint anybody. Sometimes things get through, sometimes things don't. But there's no hard and fast rule that says that in the last year or 18 months of a president's term, the Senate won't or can't act on their nominations. Carla, I know you believe that an appointment should be made. Justice Scalia would want that. He was a constitutionalist and a text, is it a textualist? Is textualist, Textualist, yes. as it would be. Can, at the same time, can President Obama, in, in your beliefs, use his own words against the Republicans? He did say to David Axelrod one time, send us someone, someone smart and advocated for Elena Kagan to be nominated. Obviously, he went with Sotomayor, but Elena Kagan was President Barack Obama's second choice, and also someone like Frank Easterbrook, who is not far to the right, but does, is a constitutionalist along the same lines as Justice Scalia. If uh, I think Obama will appoint a textualist? Well, can, can President Obama use his own words, Justice Scalia, of sending us someone smart like Elena Kagan, can he use that politically, in your mind, against the Republicans? He can try. Um, I, I think, you know, pointing us back to the governing document itself should give us the guidance that we need. And the governing document says nothing, absolutely nothing, about the president's inability to exercise this duty or this power while the president is a lame duck or during the last year before a, a, an election. So given that the Constitution says nothing about prohibiting this, the, I think, the textualist interpretation, uh, the interpretation I think that Justice Scalia would have is that the duty is to be performed. Uh, because, you know, his approach to constitutional interpretation was if the Constitution didn't say it, then we can't import it in there as if it does. So um, I think the approach here is to look at the governing document and say there's no limitation placed in the Constitution itself. So all of us have a duty, um, whether we're in the Senate, uh, whether we are, you know, advising the president to proceed in this process and give whoever the president's nominee is a fair hearing. Michael, I'm asking you to look into your crystal ball because we've, we've talked about the gridlock and everybody claiming the moral high ground right now on what to do, Republicans, Democrats. When do you think this will actually move forward? You know, I don't know. It's a, it's a calculation that the Republicans have to make. Because on the one hand, if they allow a nominee to go forward, they risk really angering their base and potentially alienating that base going into the election. At the same time, if they if they do allow a nomination, or if they don't allow a nomination to go through, 
they're going to make their base happy, but they're going to alienate independent voters who they need to win the presidency and who they need to turn out for those swing state Senate elections. So part of it comes down to Mitch McConnell looking into his crystal ball and deciding which of those two scenarios he thinks is most likely and deciding how to go forward. But I think it was a, it was a really strange decision for them to come out really early and say that they were going to block anybody who, they, mm -hmm. who President Obama nominates rather than waiting for Obama to nominate somebody and delaying on the basis of credentials or a footnote in some law review article that they'd written that they decide is troubling. Right. I really didn't understand that as a political strategy. I thought, okay, even if that's the underlying motivation, you don't say it, right? Mm -hmm. You should say, we will consider the nominee, and then, you know, you, if you dig deep enough, you can find something to point at uh, just about any nominee to say this is the reason why. Um, so I was I was surprised that they came out so adamantly uh, and, and opposed to even participating in the process. And some of the candidates that we went over confirmed 97 to nothing, 97 to zero, as little as two and a half years ago. So that's interesting. How could you backtrack on that because it's still a federal bent? Judges, I'm assuming the Supreme Court is the dream of many judges to ascend to that level. What do you think is going through some of the, the mind of some of the names that have been floated out there as possible uh, heirs to the Supreme Court? Uh, I think what's going through their mind is, boy, wouldn't I be honored to be nominated, but I wouldn't want to be the sacrificial lamb. Um, so I think it's going to be difficult to convince uh, some of these judges to to participate in the process given how strongly the Republicans have come out uh, in in opposition to the process and maybe that was their strategy um, to to make candidates run scared and say you know it's just too hot for me to to put my name forward please consider me for a future appointment um, so I'm not I'm not really sure it's definitely going to be an interesting thing that we could look forward to I don't see it going anywhere anytime soon maybe when the election is getting there, they'll finally get something done. Thank you for watching this edition of For the Record.